This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. In part three of our Narcapulco series, Douglas Tuman interviews Naomi Brockwell. Naomi is a co author, producer, host of a technology and blockchain YouTube show, NBTV, and was the MC on the Cryptopulco stage in Anarchapulco. Douglas and Naomi discuss being coin agnostic versus believing and supporting only one or two cryptocurrencies. Naomi argues that competition in the ecosystem is not necessarily a bad thing, and that focusing on the one coin to rule them all theory will cause people to miss out on what else is going on in the ecosystem as well as not help towards mass adoption. Douglas argues that only a few projects actually provide a real use case with the requisite network effect and that the coin that most closely resembles digital cash will likely be the winner. Monero Talk starts now. All right. We are at uh, Anarcopoco on the f a final day. I believe it's the final day. Um, it's been a long haul. I am with Naomi Brockwell. Naomi, how's it going? It's going pretty well. It's been a, a really fun conference, and I mean, we're just sitting here on the beach now, so that's not a bad way to end things. How would you say the conference has gone overall? So you were basically in charge of the, the crypto aspect of the conference. What, what was your uh, kind of your overall take on it? So I, I got to MC the TDV stage and Crypto Pool Co. And, um, and all in all, I mean, there were some great speakers. And uh, the general vibe of the event, I'd say, was great. It's a very relaxed crowd. It's a lot more relaxed than conferences you know, that I'm used to. And so it was refreshing, you know, very fun, very interactive. There was like a, a decentralized dance party last night at the gala dinner, an impromptu one. So that was really fun. And I just, I, I just think this was a really fun event. So obviously this is the Monero show, the Monero talk show, where we always uh, bring it back to Monero. Um, I did a talk a few days ago. I was impressed by the interaction uh, with the talk after I did the talk. There were a lot of questions, but I was also surprised by the fact that a lot of people here uh, don't really know about Monero as much as I think they would. What's what's kind of your opinion there? I mean, this being an uh, anarchist conference, it seems like the ideals would really align with the ideals of Monero. Is there a disconnect there? I think that there's a lack of education there. Um, but it's not unlike any other conference. Like I would say that overwhelmingly the people here are more educated about crypto than at lots of conferences I go to, um, especially because this isn't a crypto specific conference. And a lot of the, you know, libertarian events that I MC, you'll ask about crypto and like 50% of the crowd will still be like, oh, I don't know about that, you know? And to be able to talk to a, a group of people here and have everyone in the audience be like, yeah, obviously crypto is the future, is refreshing. Now, the fact that they haven't keyed into privacy coins yet and understood the benefits of those uh, from a tracking perspective Perspective, from a you know sovereignty over your data perspective, um, there's still a bit to go. You know, we we have some work to do in terms of education. But I think honestly, this crowd is a is ahead of most of them out there. So I was I was really impressed. All right, yeah, we don't we don't really go to too many conferences, um, so I guess we don't really have a, a, a good comparison point there. Um, so what is your take on on privacy? We don't like to call them privacy coins on this show. Uh, we like. No, we. I mean, I. Well, because I see it more as, uh, you know, just cryptocurrency. Um, you know, a true cryptocurrency should be private at its protocol level. So to call it a privacy coin is kind of to like call cash privacy cash. So you know, we we call it cash. We don't call it privacy cash. So I kind of see it as digital cash. So which which ones are kind of mimicking digital cash the best? And uh, I personally think that's Monero, but. What is your what is your current take 
on if we have to call them privacy coins. What is your current take on privacy coins? Uh, well, I love the word. I think it's important to make a distinction between the cryptocurrencies that have privacy elements and those that don't. Uh, if you just default, well, we like to call Bitcoin a surveillance coin, so we make the <laughs> distinction that way. <laughs> that's uh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that people do have to realize that there is a lot of transparency in, in other cryptocurrencies. Obviously, I mean, I am crypto agnostic. I like a lot of different coins in the space. I think there's value and use cases to a lot of different ones. Um, and so, I, I mean, I see, it, uh, uh, I see Bitcoin is great, but I really like privacy coins because I think that it's just tremendously important to have control over your data. And a lot of people don't realize, I mean, I see so many people, even at this conference, I have to call out the attendees. I'm sorry that we went to a bar the other night and there's um, there's a sign on the wall that says they accept cryptocurrency. I got super excited. And so I said to them, I was trying to talk. I don't speak any Spanish, so it was difficult. Um, the judge said, you know, can I, can I pay with Dash? Can I pay with Bitcoin Cash? Can I pay with any of these ones that they had listed there? And they kind of looked at me like, mm, we know the signs there, but we were really hoping no one would take us up on this. And um, and as it came down, I think I chatted to the manager and said, can I pay with this? And I didn't want to be an asshole about it. There's like a room filled with people. They're busy taking orders. This isn't the time to be teaching the staff how to do this stuff. Um, but the thing was, is that clearly this is a place where someone had approached them and said, will you accept crypto? And their response was yes. And I think that's awesome. But because there's been no demand from consumers at that bar, the staff lost the skill set. They didn't, uh, they didn't know how to do it when it was needed. And I'm sorry, but that's on the people. That's on the crypto people not giving that demand to the bar. We had a room filled with people and every single one of them knew about crypto. Every single one of them. I would, I would bet that at least 50% of them held, were holding crypto on them. And I was the only person in that room that asked them, can you accept my crypto for this drink? Without the demand, they're not going to retrain their staff. They have absolutely no reason to do that. So that's on us. If we really believe that this is the future, we need to be making sure that we're pushing the merchants and saying, you know, we will give you our business if you accept cryptocurrency. That's the only way we can do this. So although, you know, I... I, I love the people here and their enthusiasm, but it's it's fine to talk on a stage about this. We have to walk the walk as well. And uh, just using this in an everyday occurrence is, is important. And if we're using money in an everyday you know point of view, like I was, I was leading into this because I was just saying like so many people were just so happy to use their credit cards. They were so happy to give away their data, that financial data that's being harvested and then sold off to a third party, that financial data that's being tracked by the government and held in a permanent record associated with our identity for all time. They were so happy to give that away, even though we have better alternatives, uh, alternatives like privacy coins where they don't get any information about us. So I'm just wondering why we're still choosing the easier method. If we are really activists, we should be putting in the effort and laying the foundation so that this can be an easier process for everyone. We're the ones who are willing to deal with some of the friction there, um, but without us making those first steps, no one's gonna be using this stuff. Yeah, I don't know what I think about that. I mean, obviously, I agree with you. Like, ideally, it'd be great uh, if people kind of walk the walk, like you're like you're saying. But I feel like um, people should be walking the walk because it makes sense for them to walk the walk. Uh, it shouldn't really come out of uh, a sacrifice. It should be more of that. It makes sense for them to do so. I would disagree with that. Um, I would say that no change comes in society without someone sticking their neck out and taking the first steps. We're at the early stages right now. The tech is not advanced. It's not that sophisticated. It's, uh, there is friction. Um, but but that, that's why you see this whole like digital gold meme, right? So like the first use case being, or one of the first use cases being, uh, just hold your crypto because it will go up in value uh, and it's digital gold. Another use case being, all right, well, if you want to buy something on, on the dark web, you should probably use something like Monero. I'm not sure I understand your point. Uh, can my, you my, my, my point being that there are like use cases for it today that don't really involve sacrifice that actually makes sense for you to do, not because you're being an activist, just because it actually makes sense for you to do. Like, so 
uh, buy buy Bitcoin because you think it's going to be worth more tomorrow than it is today. Buy Monero because you think it's digital gold. Uh, use Monero because you have to buy something anonymously. So we could just stick with the current use case, which is fringe case, which is black market, and we're always going to be a fringe product. If we want this to be mainstream, I'm sorry we're competing against Visa and MasterCard. These are frictionless systems. These are constantly improving. They're not just staying static while the crypto tries to get that, the crypto world gets their act together. They're improving at the same time. I used my Monero last night, by the way. I'm saying I, I did do it, but it, it, it was regrettingly. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you know, I... I well, because uh, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I see value in my Monero. I see it as a but as why better. Why, why, why not just sell it and buy more? Like, well, I... yeah, that's that's what I did. But, you know, it's 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 extra steps. Uh, I do. Obviously, I see your reasoning as to how it does help, uh, obviously, spread spread Monero and make it actually useful in the real world. But my hope is or my thinking is that this is not it's not going to be adopted through this kind of sacrifice and people kind of out there pushing it as you know we're, we're trying to change the world which i obviously so i'm, I'm here to change the world are doing at the moment with, um, well i i think it just has to serve a real use case and that's what's going to allow it to to take the system like how we i mean how do we have this crypto i mean it's not like vcs came along and said we really need you know decentralized cash well no, the the use case was actually uh d sacrificing their time and dedicating it towards the system this entire ecosystem is individuals reaching out to other peers taking time out of their schedule they don't have to say to the taxi driver hey i'll give you a tip if it's in crypto but they're choosing to they're going out on a limb whether it's a small sacrifice or it's a large one everyone who's brought this uh this ecosystem forward has done so by going above and beyond what they needed to, what was just for their own personal gain. And of course, we could all say that, well, it's all for our personal gain, because as soon as we grow the ecosystem, we all benefit from that. But uh, so if you want to look at it in that way, you know, it's not altruistic by going out and teaching people about this or, or being a trailblazer. It's just, you know, I'm thinking in my rational self-interest of the future, and this is going to help everyone. But I think that at the end of the day, you know, we, we I, I don't think it's bad to look at the people who are sticking their neck out and really trying hard to push this ecosystem forward honestly i think they're an inspiration 100 percent. i, I kind of see myself as being one of those people i mean uh i'm i'm here you know i have my nine to five job there's no reason why i uh, yeah i should be here um you know i i i use monero i buy monero my whole my whole reasoning for being behind monero is that i i hope it will preserve uh, liberty in the digital age. I hope to preserve open societies in the digital age. Uh, but me being somebody who's kind of practical, I'm realizing that for this to work, it needs to actually fulfill a use case. It needs to add some efficiency to people's lives. It needs to. There needs to be a reason. And I personally think there are reasons. I, I think. I think the digital goal thing is a real thing. I think. I mean. I think sovereign money is a real thing. It's not just about sacrifice. I mean, sovereign money has a lot of value to it. Uh, I ultimately think it will it will take over. And if you own, if you own some of it now, uh, you'll probably be very wealthy in the future when it does take over. To one of your points you mentioned earlier. Um, so actually, I've forgotten. <laughs> Never <Yeah>. mind. <laughs> okay. Wait, you sure? Yeah, I, I completely lost my train. Of okay. Um, so so wait, let's uh, let's I guess let's dive a little bit more on the whole on the whole privacy coin thing because you're saying you're coin agnostic so here we are we're talking about how you should be an activist and how you should be out there doing things and how you should really kind of uh you know believe in these philosophies so why are why aren't you just hardcore about one or two coins or choosing ones that you think actually live up to the ideals of what this stuff's supposed to be about as opposed to being coin agnostic which is kind of i feel like uh you know not really choosing the ones that will that you that you do think will actually change the world and live up to these ideals because i don't think that it's smart um i i've been in this space for a really really long time and i probably emceed more conferences in the space than anyone else in the world and the benefit of that has been that i've been able to keep my ears to the ground of what's going on and one of the most exciting things for me has been discovering new teams who are working on developing really exciting tech. We really truly have competition in money now. You know, this is this wonderful Hayekian principle of competing currencies and we have that. 
and we're looking at this wonderful experimentation and uh, seeing what works. So I um, obviously I have my favorites, but what I'm are you, uh, what are your favorites? Uh, I'll get to set, but I'm not a maximalist in um, in any respect because I'm not. I, I don't know. I, I attribute maximalism to this kind of religious zealot behavior where people put on blinders. They get so focused on one coin that they lose track of all the innovation going on in the rest of the ecosystem which personally I, th I think is fantastic and so many teams are learning from each other like I mean you look at Chris Pacia Bitcoin Cash developer he's taken the technology for his neutrino wallet from the Lightning Labs team you know you have Wasabi and the BTC side who have looked at what they're doing on, on Bitcoin Cash with Coin Shuffle um, with Cash Shuffle and uh, Cash Fusion and saying you know this is really cool tech you have Vitalik with Ethereum you know mentioning other coins and say well maybe we could use these chains and for certain uh, purposes and I mean even interoperability things like Komodo where it, it, Veris that notarizes to Komodo Komodo that notarizes to Bitcoin like they're all really interesting experiments and um, and I think as soon as people become like head in the sand I'm just this one thing they put on these blinders that is is not particularly healthy um, when we're just discussing innovation in a competitive marketplace yeah, one hundred percent. Totally agree with that. By the way, um, you know, I, I think you should always be open. Well, I think you should be listening to everybody, but I don't think you need to agree with everybody. For example, Daniel Krawitz spoke this morning, as you know, and he and he spoke about Bitcoin SV. I'm personally not uh, a, a big believer in uh, Satoshi's vision, Bitcoin Satoshi vision, um, <laughs> but I do listen to everything that man says. I think he's a really smart guy. I think he. Um, I don't really know where he's coming from and what he truly believes, but I think he kind of opens your mind when he speaks. He, he kind of gives you a, a perspective, whether or not it's controversial, but he gives you kind of like different perspectives and, and, and it's something to think about. So just as an example, like even even that I listen to. But ultimately on this show, so I, I'm not a I'm not I like to call myself a digital cash maximalist, so not a Monero maximalist but a digital cash maximalist so trying to find the coin that i believe uh does digital cash the best why just one why why choose just one like when you say you're trying to find one that does it the best um is is that a d conscious decision to just try and pick one and why narrow yourself well um i haven't been convinced you know i think there'll be multiple coins in the future but I think there'll only be a few. And I think one of the, the greatest use cases is the original pitch for Bitcoin, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, digital cash system. So I'm looking for the one that does that the best. So why the one that does that the best? Why are you looking for a singular one? Could it be possible that we have like an interoperability between coins and sort of a, um, a, a very li liquid market where they're interchangeable? Because I think we have that at the moment. Well, because I think the network effect is a very real thing. I think I think there's reason to believe that the one that does that the best will take the largest market share. Um, currently, that appears to be that's Bitcoin that's that's winning in that in that respect. Uh, but I think ultimately the technology that mimics digital cash the best uh, will become the strongest coin, and it makes sense for everybody to essentially be using the same protocol to transact. Uh, you know, digitally on on the internet. I I disagree with that. I tend to go more on the side of what someone like Scott Stornetta says. So he was the inventor of the early blockchain. He cited over half of the citations in the white paper were for his project um, and his work with Stuart Haber. And uh, and his opinion on this when I interviewed him was that you know we're going to end up with these wallets and we probably don't even know what's going on under the hood we're going to have this very liquid interchangeability uh, between coins because we have different ecosystems I mean we look around at the moment what do we see now we don't see one currency dominating we have the US trying to make a stranglehold and have trying to have a government enforced monopoly on the world by making it the the um, you know global reserve but currency. it is dominating because of a, a government enforced monopoly. And so what we actually have in essence, instead of that, is we have the yen and we have the Australian dollar and we have the Canadian dollar. And then we have all different payment systems. Like we have PayPal and Venmo and Patreon. Like why do we need PayPal if we already have the exact same functionality? Why, why do we need Patreon if we have the exact same functionality in PayPal? 
Well, because it's a different culture, it's a different ecosystem, it serves a very specific purpose. And and I think over the last decade, we've really seen that blossom in the crypto space, different ecosystems. You know, um, Steam isn't something that I hold, but it's something that I benefit from and I use on a daily basis because I make money off my Steam it page um, in Steam. Right, but that's kind of niche, right? It's during, doing something niche as opposed to digital. It's absolutely all niche. That's what I'm saying. So you end up with these very specific use cases. And I think that the markets are trying to you know find what their use cases are you know there's a place there's a place for fiat there's a place for gold there's a place for monero there's a place for um you know dash or bitcoin cash or steam or any of these uh, other currencies that are platform specific i think that we're trying to find our way and and i would i mean we'll have to see what happens because none of us know this is all an experiment and but i my prediction would be more in line with what um what scott says in that we're just going to end up with this very vibrant uh, economy of all these competing currencies and I, I see no reason why one of them is going to just win in that um, the same way that I don't see Venmo just winning outright or I don't see PayPal just winning outright you know we're seeing people choosing to use different ones Facebook cash um, all these other systems and I think I think the crypto space is going to be the same but we'll have to see I don't know yeah no I obviously know better than yeah. no no better than you um but yeah, I guess my, my opinion would be that there'd be one or two and the network effect is going to play a very large role in it. Uh, just like we see with money and we see with any other protocol, yeah, we see with I languages. I agree with because previously, I mean, there's, there's no reason to think that anymore. We've had money converging onto one market choice in the past because it was physical. So you couldn't, like it just wasn't physically feasible to walk around with a bag where you had gold and you had silver and you had seashells and you had salt and you had cigarettes and you had whatever other currency people were using. It made absolutely no sense. But, so but gold had... converged on this one choice, which was gold old because it had you know the attribute based theory of money it ticked all the boxes it was fungible uh easily right it ticked all the boxes um there's no reason why we need that in the digital space when it's not physically burdensome to carry around multiple currencies right but but like as you said gold became gold because it ticked all the you know checked all the boxes right, right? so we're, we're not we're not seashells are not gold today right because or whatever they're you know they're they're not scarce for example so they don't they don't check all the boxes so you don't think the digital form of that the one that checks all the boxes will will be the gold of of crypto so the reason that society converged on one choice as the best and didn't just you know it wasn't just accepted at all places because you need that network effect you needed people to accept it and uh and in the case of gold i mean you couldn't walk around with alternatives if you're carrying around gold it's burdensome you, you can't carry around a lot of it. You can't carry around all these alternatives and say, well, let me just open up my briefcase. I've got 100 different currencies here. There's absolutely no physical reason why I can't have 100 different currencies in my phone. And yeah, but what, what, would you, what other thing out there resembles gold in terms of all the boxes it checks? Something that's fungible, that's scarce, um, that you know, can be broken down to the basically atom. I mean, like, what, what, what else basically... What else even fulfills those properties? So we had lots of different competing currencies, and it depends on the ecosystem. In prisons, gold is worthless. It's, it's not used in Auschwitz. In, in Auschwitz, cigarettes were a currency, right? So it all depends on, on the community and, and the um, hierarchy of needs of, of the person at the time. If you're in a desert and you're, you're dying of thirst, gold is not going to be worth anything to you. You know, Worth is all subjective in this case. So water is going to be the most valuable thing to you. That's probably going to be a currency in those systems. So, um, you know, the fact that we can now live in this global economy where we're dealing with all different scenarios, there are people in the desert, there are, you know, all of this. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we don't need to be burdened down by like having to carry all of these options with us. And so it really doesn't affect people to have all these options, which are very useful in different ecosystems. As I mentioned, you know, like in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, for example, Bitcoin Cash is accepted at like a hundred different merchants. Super easy. So of course, I'm going to carry Bitcoin Cash when I'm going there. Dash as well. Dash is another option. If they don't accept Bitcoin Cash, they accept Dash. So they're two options I'll keep in my wallet. Uh, if I go to Perth, Australia, they, there was nowhere that accepted Bitcoin Cash there until a couple of weeks ago. So Bitcoin and Ethereum was something that I would carry around with me. Um, um, if you go to you know, other places, like for example, uh, there's lots of privacy-centric websites that 
forced you to use privacy coins as a means of protecting. So you're going to want to have those as well so that you can accept them there. So I think that it just depends, you know, what ecosystem you're dealing with. And because it's not burdensome on me to carry multiple, I mean, I'm not going to narrow my choices uh, unnecessarily. Okay. F final question. So, uh, so one of the themes that kept coming up at the conference was – uh, kind of this Monero versus Bitcoin or Monero versus Bitcoin SV, if you really want to take it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was kind of, um, they're described as essentially being opposites, right? So Monero being anonymous and private at the protocol level, uh, Bitcoin um, being transparent at the protocol level. And there's this kind of this argument that uh, Monero will, will lead to a world that essentially will allow for for, for crime to happen. Um, oh, no, people might decide what to put into their own bodies and like, do terrible Yeah, I guess, what's what's your opinion? Do you want to live in a, in a Monero world or do you want to live in a, a, a transparent ledger world like Bitcoin? Uh, you know, if you, if you could choose one or the other, if one were to take over, which world would you rather live in? I think it's a false dichotomy and it's not the right question. The alternative is, do we want a world that is centrally controlled and that relies on patent law and that relies on government coercion because that seems to be the narrative that comes out of the BSP. But how is that? A, they're, they're, they're two different things. One's a transparent ledger where all transactions could potentially be traced and tracked. And one is one that's obfuscated where we can't trace and track. So I'm talking about the difference between BSV and Monero in general, not about the transparency. Um, and I would, I mean, I'm not a fan of the rhetoric that comes out of BSV. So my choice is obviously towards the more freedom oriented one, the, the one that gives people back freedom uh, over their data, freedom and control over their transactions and uh, isn't open and transparent. You know, I think that we have the right to financial privacy. Awesome. Thanks for answering uh, all the hard questions. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.